Hello folks, welcome to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society July tasting. I'm sure we've got lots for you to enjoy tonight. I particularly am actually looking forward to it because with me tonight, and I'll introduce them in a moment, we have our spirits educator, Dr. Andy Forrester, and Ewan Campbell, our spirits manager. So all of those questions that you've always wondered about but were afraid to ask, tonight is your chance because these two gentlemen will be able to tell you lots of stuff about casks and flavours. The other thing we'd like to talk about generally, we're just hoping to have a kind of round the table chat tonight rather than a presentation. And what we're really, you know that we're in the midst of an information gathering piece about our flavour profiles. We have 12 flavour profiles, as you know, and we've got five which will be on display tonight. So if you've got any comments about our flavour profiles, please let us have them. We'll be welcome to hear what you have to say. We also sent you out a direct link to our flavour profiles uh, with, uh, with the news about the, the tasting. So sometimes when you can't think of what it is that you're actually experiencing with the aroma and your palate, maybe sometimes referring to that will give you a little bit of a starter for 10, as it were. So feel free to use those if you like. And I always think, you know, so there's two ways to do the tasting. Either read the tasting notes, then taste the whiskey, or taste the whiskey and then look at the tasting notes after you've decided what you're experiencing. And that second way is much more fun, I think, anyway, because it lets you explore your own experiences and memories and stuff. Now, to so uh, with me tonight, as I say, uh, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Andy Forrester. Andy. Would you like to introduce yourself? Evening, John. How are you doing? Not bad, not bad at all. It, it looks as though you're up north. I am indeed. I'm overlooking Loch Long at this minute. Good man. Well, I'm in a lovely location too. Good to see you anyway. Uh, thanks for the invite to have a chat with yourself and Ewan and all of our members out there. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, quick introduction then. So I'm, I'm known as Dr. Andy amongst all the uh, colleagues at the Society. Uh, my role is spirits educator. Mostly what I do is um, provide our ambassadors with uh, knowledge about uh, our own whiskies, what you and Kai are doing with the maturation program, for example, but also sort of more broader uh, whiskey education. Been in the whiskey industry for what? Getting on for 20 years, worked with some of the big distillers and also worked at the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute. So I've got quite a lot of sort of, um, I guess, technical and scientific insight particularly in terms of where flavour comes from in the production process, whether it be in the distillery or during maturation. So please, as John said, everyone, do throw those questions at us and we'll do our best to answer them. And as we go through each of the whiskies, I'll try and give you some little nuggets of information about where flavour comes from, because we all know that's good social currency. And it's always good to be able to drop a little uh, little nugget of info in, with your mates when you're sharing a dram. So um, looking forward to it. Thanks, John. I'll um, let you Introduce Absolutely, you. Andy. And just before we bring you in, hiya Tamara. Nice to hear from you. Nadja and Jens in Frankfurt. Peter Reichwald, hello there. Ali Cam, Jul Whiskey Julian. Greg, yeah, great stuff. Great to hear from you all. Keep on telling us who you are and where you're from. But at this point, I will bring in Ewan, our spirits manager. And if some of you might remember a bottle from an out a few out turns ago called the Big Ginger Frame of It. Well, that was a direct reference to Mr. Campbell. You and Hi guys. How, how are you going? I'm all right. All right, Ewan. Very, uh, very glad to join you this evening, guys. Uh, so I'm Ewan. I'm the spirits manager here at the Society. Um, I look after buying all of our, our spirit and wood. Um, I will look after spirit quality and work with our tasting panel on selecting all of these lovely drams that we're about to try tonight, um, as well as a little bit of blending as well. Um, and I get to, to work with Andy. We get to visit some fantastic distilleries and cooperages, um, you know, all to try and create these fantastic whiskies that have been guided to the, the bottle by SMWS. Great stuff, you and thank you very much. And hello, Anne, Anne Bingham from down in Southampton there. She's appeared in one or two of our unfilters. And I know somewhere, hi, Anne, 
I know somewhere, though he hasn't announced himself yet, we have an Australian member currently living in Woking called Kim Promets, Promnitz. And when Kim told me on social media that he was going to join the tasting, he mentioned that he perhaps needed elocution lessons because I was going to be talking. Now, I don't know whether he meant elocution lessons for him or elocution lessons for me. But anyway, Kim, I hope that you're listening and you can understand everything I say. Kim does admit, by the way, as an Australian, that his favourite Scottish accent is Mel Gibson's in Braveheart. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so without further ado, folks, let's go on to whiskey, our first whiskey. Well, the order tonight, by the way, folks, you probably want to know that order. Have you got your, your glasses, your tasting mat and your, your pairings all set out with a bit of luck? But the order is going to be 8229, 11335, 134.11, 9193 and Closing with 42.54. Four of these whiskies are Scotch, one is non-Scotch. And we talked about flavour profiles earlier and flavour and taste. This is a little taste extravaganza of bourbon casks. These are all bourbon casks at different parts of the cycle that they're used in whiskey. So you'll be able to hopefully see the differences in the colour and discern the differences in flavour that we can create by using different types of bourbon cask, okay? Okay, so number one then, folks, is 82.29. And we've uh, we suggested pairing this with a little beer. Uh, in the west of Scotland, we call this a half and a half, which is Glaswegian for a half and a half, okay? So I've got a, a whiskey from SMWS and a beer from Glasgow Beer Works. So that should be very good. <laughs> yes, Kim. <laughs> nice comment there. So, <laughs> so let's go. Let's go first of all to you and tell us a little about this one, Ewan. Yeah. Well, um, so nine years old, um, and uh, and it's a second full bourbon barrel. So less active than a first fill. Lets the spirit kind of shine through a little bit. Um, the, the initial character on the nose for me, I got kind of biscuity, almost grassy, and then it goes to orangey grapefruit kind of style. Um, I definitely agree with the citrus. Oh, yeah, really zingy, um, but very fruity, and there's a kind of honey, lemony lozenge thing um, yeah. on the taste as well. Mm. Quite a fat distillate. It's quite creamy. Yeah. It's quite rich on the palate, isn't it? Yeah. Some of you might know that as a very young lad, well, even as a very, very old lad, I used to go and watch Partick Thistle Football Club at Fir Hill. And they used to have a man come round with a tray selling coconut bars and spearmint chewing gum. Well, this one actually was giving me some of the flavour of that gum, chewing gum, that I used to get way back at, in the olden days at Partick Thistle, which is which is something which you might come across, folks. Sometimes an aroma and a flavour will take you back to something that's in your memory, in your head, and that's sometimes the wonder of a tasting note. What about you, Andy? What do you think about this one? I, I agree with you. Uh, so... <laughs> yeah, no, I think um like it a lot. Um I think there's quite a lot of nose prickle uh from this one. It's um so I'm I'm gonna add a little bit of water from my elegant water jug here. And just... <laughs> now the, this one's up at uh sixty two point one percent and the so yeah. explain the, the, the nose tickle. Yeah, so exactly that. So that's the first thing I wanted to do. And um I think you know Yoon's absolutely right, there's all those kind of citrusy Great, that grapefruity character is quite grassy and um, uh, hay-like, if you like, as well. But um, and I noticed in the notes from the panel, which everybody are on these little cards that are in the packs there, and I noticed that they they said, you know, with the reduced palate, the, um, the, uh, the 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 cask flavors really started to develop. And sure enough, actually, you know, I'm getting a lot. Of, well, there was hints of coconut um, at full strength, but with the water, 
the vanilla, coconut, and sort of spicy castor eye flavors seem to be to be coming through. Um, this is this is a, a distillery I had the pleasure of visiting uh, a few years back when I was still at the the research institute, and um, it's fascinating. Old Victorian buildings. Um, it shares shares a town with that infamous North Port distillery that I know a lot of enthusiasts um, get excited about, but. Um, the, the, I was showing the, the lovely man, the distillery manager or distilleries director for the group, and um, his thoughts on Glen, uh, on on um, on this distillery uh, and what it's there to do is to produce a really light, fairly rapidly maturing spirit. And I think my view is that's really come to play here. We've got lots of that kind of light, fruity, sort of gives a very estery pear drops, apple type spirit. We've got and, and the citrus. We've got all of that, but even with, as Ewan says, that sort of slightly less active second fill bourbon cast, so we're not masking all that lovely distillery character, but even so, because it is such a delicate spirit, we've got the influence of the, of the cast there as well. And um, the distillery setup is such that the, the, the line arms, so that the pipe that comes from the top of the still to the condenser, um, that's got a really, really steep angle on it at this distillery. And... Um, that means we get lots of reflux, which means we get lots of additional uh, extra copper contact, which usually means uh, we get quite a uh, light fruity spirit. I was doing a little bit of research and just checking up earlier. Quite short fermentation times, though. Um, and I, I think I'm wondering you, and I don't know what your thoughts, John, as well. You know, those short fermentation times means that, yes, we're creating that fruity character, which is then sort of concentrated through that distillation, but why we're also still seeing uh, some of that kind of cereal-like character, the grassy, hay-like aromas that that you and picked out straight away. So you know, you know me, I like to relate process to to flavour. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Hopefully, yeah. you know, hopefully that's a huge, little bit of insight for everyone, and happy to take uh, you know any questions on that. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's hear your questions because that's uh, it's very interesting, that Andy, because we've spent. Quite a long time since you came on board, uh, the ambassadors and you talking about, you know, where flavours can, can arise from and how mm. things can be very different from one distillery with a similar process to the next. It's all very, very fascinating. Yeah, but uh, you know, this is this is massively creamy and, and vanilla-like once it starts to develop in the glass. And I mean, you and I have better insight here. I mean, of course, you know, we've done a lot. We, you know, it's our maturation that has resulted in this whiskey. Or, or bit, you know, even though we talk about the the origin of the spirit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I, I was definitely getting some oak, oak coming mm. through. No doubt about well, it. I, I don't know if we've said it yet, <laughs> John. I might have missed it, but for everyone, you know, just a wee reminder: this is from our juicy oak and vanilla flavor profile. And um, yeah, I'll be honest. I thought, well, hmm, yeah, that interesting for, for for spirit from this distillery. But yeah, you know, refill cast, but it, it's you know, it's definitely got that. Vanilla, sweet, coconut, oaky, wood-derived character. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's a spot-on uh, assessment of where those flavors are coming from. The the grassy kind of sweet hay flavors from the spirit with a bit of fruit as well, and then the coconutty, bit spicy, bit minty, all coming from this really good bourbon barrel. It's a great yeah. balance. Ma you, you, you're right, you and and for me, you know, you you get asked what is great whiskey, what makes a whiskey good, and you know, my my answer was always where there's the right balance between the character of the spirit, so you can sort of see where it's from, and the influence of the wood. And for me, that's right. what makes great whiskey. Right. Yeah, whiskey you can great. you can almost chew that whiskey. Yeah, They're really yeah. nice, very juicy and very chewy, and lovely tannins. That that kind of astringent feeling, that drying around the, the gums folks you know that's the tannins which are, are extracted from from the wood uh giving that that, that nice mouthfeel and that structure to the whiskey great stuff so is that oh, 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 everyone's enjoying that you've got any comments well the same or you get something different please let us know um i always when, when i do a live tasting i like to ask which whiskey people preferred as we go through so so far who preferred number one? <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, Kim, Kim Promnitz. Hi, good day to you too, Kim. Kim also happened to mention to me in social media uh, when we had our little exchange about this distillery being in the Southern Highlands. And I said to him, well, Kim, I think you should turn your map round the other way. <laughs> 
<laughs> so there you go. There you go. So it's uh so the next one for hope you all enjoyed that. I'm looking forward to any comments you got to have. And now we're moving on. John, John, yeah. McShane, just just while you're on comments, let's not lose it. John Cameron, and thank you. Oily and Coastal um, is a great profile. So make sure we come back to that because I know it's going to get lost as we go, as the comments oh, yeah, start okay, coming yeah, in. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We have an Oily and Coastal coming up. Grab that John. one because I'd, like to, good, good I'd like to talk about that. So thanks, John. Yeah, it's a, yeah, a great good, one for everyone. Yeah, good point, John. Well done. Good stuff. Excellent starting, Ari Cam says. Shoodle with vanilla cream, Clay nice. Mac says. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Uh, Apples yeah, yeah, and... yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems to have gone down well, that one. Glad about... Look, by the way, if you want to buy any of those bottles tonight, uh, there is obviously a, a secret code for the folk who have joined on the tasting. So uh, I'll tell you what that is towards the end. Maybe Andrew, our producer, can maybe put it on the messaging as well if any of you are interested in getting a bottle. So we're moving from... Uh, Juicy oak and vanilla now to light and delicate. Andy, do you want to take this one away? I can do. Do you want to do, you want to do the, the basic intro or do you just want me to get on with it? <laughs> uh, tell us whatever you think is appropriate about it. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, the age and the, the barrel and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, John. Thanks. As you say, um, from Distillery 113 and, and sitting in our light and delicate flavor profile, um, which being able to decode 113, um, you know, doesn't come as a big surprise. Again, a distillery that produces a very light, delicate style of spirit. And again, interestingly, because of the configuration and very narrow neck stills with uh, ascending line arms. Um, 22 years old, so a lot, lot longer than our previous whiskey now in cask. Again, refill X bourbon. And I've I'm about to put my nose in the glass. What I'm going to be really intrigued to see here is, on the face of it, lots and lots of stuff the same, but actually, as we all know, there's this huge diversity of flavour, um, and, and, and as you can see, the flavour uh, – sorry, the, 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 this society tasting panel have very clearly put these first two whiskies in very different flavour profiles. Um, so let, let's have a little bit of a, a dip in here. Uh, more gentle on the nose, um, lower strength, and an older whiskey, so maybe maybe not a big surprise. Um, definitely light and, and, and delicate. Um, again, some nice sort of grassy grassy character as well. Hay like, floral perhaps. Um, you and I know you're you're, you're much better with the language um, the flavour than I am. So feel free, step in, throw some uh, tasting notes at me. Well, on your floral, I think I'm getting a kind of blossomy or almost strawberry kind of thing on the nose. Yes. With with the, the green uh, top as well, so you've just picked these fresh strawberries. Um, definitely you, you get your grassy. Again? Sorry? I definitely get your grassy side as well, though. I'm also getting a little bit of spring meadow as well. Mm. Daff yeah. Daffodils, gorse, yeah. And folks, remember, look, look, this is, you know, while we while, while we wax lyrical about um, all of these flavours, you know, remember all of your experiences are unique to yourself and all valid, so stick them in the chat. Um, you and as well, a little mintiness. Um, and it also, I mean, oft, you know, you often see strawberries served with a, a sprig of mint. And uh, I got strawberries and mint, which is, that's lovely. Maybe even a little bit of sort of nettliness that we describe sometimes. Um Hot house, you know, you know, Kai's classic hot house flowers, that sort of greenhousey character. Yeah, absolutely. Vine yeah. leaves, tomato leaves. Bit of lavender in there too, lime. Yeah, yeah, agree, John. Yeah, fresh, fresh lime juice, definitely. Yeah, um, I think we talked about the short fermentation on the last one. Yeah, and this one, I think the last one is fi around fifty hours, and this one's close yeah. to seventy. Yeah, yeah over 70. so a little bit more of these fruits and esters as well. Um, yeah, no, you're right. I, I picked up exactly that as well when I was flicking through your, uh, you know, our, our, our old friend, um, Malt Whiskey Yearbook, which is always a for everyone that's a great reference book if you if you want yeah. some, you know, nuggets of information about distilleries and you know, are interested in this sort of associating what you with what you experience in the glass and, and maybe what's gone on in the distillery. Um, so, have you got your copy there to wave, Ewan? Um, 
think um, I've handily tidied it away. No, okay. I can't find it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, re- I mean, that's really. You know, there you go, folks. Just, that's the fella. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. Comes it, out every every autumn for the following year's version, so it'll be out for 2022 about I think October. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a great handbook, folks. It really is, and it's also got insights into trends and, yeah. and what's going on in the industry. But yeah, um, you know, the, the the first one. I mean, you know, as as if you look across the industry now, uh, you know, shorter fermentation times are perhaps the except not. not Exceptions may be the wrong word, but most people are, are fermenting for a lot longer, very really short and, and, and very long fermentation times. And uh, I don't know whether that's evident in the fact that this has got much more of that light feel, those kind of heavier, really cereal notes that are definitely present in our first whiskey uh, are perhaps um, absent or downplayed significantly here. They're talking uh, about and- adding a little bit of water. Um, I don't know if any of you use pipettes. No. Uh, th- th- there are some of some of our people in society say that if you have to use a pipette, you need to go on to the jog the water jug pouring course. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because part of the aesthetic is getting that little bit of water poured from a little jug into the glass, rather than using a pipette, which makes you feel as if you're in a laboratory or something. So, but I think uh, with the with water, I think this one. Really opens up and becomes much fresher and fruitier. It's pretty spicy too, actually. You know, there is a lot of wood influence here. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking on the uh, the side here, and um, your friend uh, Kim, Kim's in there with strawberry creams. You know, absolutely agree. I like that Martin, Martin Shand, um, freshly cut hedge. That's a really <laughs> lovely kind of summery, <laughs> reminiscent of summer, and and and. and I can, tell you, I, can, I, can tell, I can tell you, Martin, you can bet your butt. It's not me that cuts that edge. I've got a man comes in and does that sort of thing. <laughs> and I, I, like, I like Claire's comment because she's actually been transported somewhere now. And whiskey does that, doesn't it? You know, it Absolutely. can take you to the pier at Brookladdy, you know, which is, you know, just an experience yes. I had. And Claire's in uh, having a picnic in, in a summer flower meadow. And I think that's... I, that's the really lovely way to express these flavor experiences. You know, I'm very analytical about it coming from a science background it tends to be a little bit dull, but I love that evocative, uh, t- those evocative tasting notes. One of the What's other the things, one, one of the other things I, um, I love about the SMWS bottlings is that because it's single cast, we can tell you the exact distillation date. Mm. And sometimes that date means something in somebody's life and just, brings a completely added thrill to that bottle because of the date. And sometimes it's just the number. Just the number actually means something. And I've had a few bottles over time like this. And this particular bottle, it was uh, it's 18 years old, but it actually it was uh, distilled uh, when uh, on our 18th anniversary, on the SMWS 18th anniversary. So there you go. And if you're an utter geek like me, John, it's also interesting sometimes to look at when the spirit was distilled and have a think about whether the distillery was doing things differently in those days. You know, we've all got those examples about, yeah. you know, switching from coal fire stills to steam steam coils, for example, or, you know, other switches in production that we know have famously happened at distilleries. So, and, you know, that's a re- another really interesting way to explore flavour and, Another good, re- what you know, another reason why it's so great to have as society members access to all of these, you know, single cast malt whiskies with all of the information that you and and I and Kai work to to provide you with, because it can, we, you know, it, it it puts a story in the glass as well as some great tasting whiskey and flavors, doesn't it? Yeah, with this particular distillery, by the way, we have uh, in recent years had six different flavor profiles. Now, that's six different flavor profiles. Mm. Uh, from the same spirit, and you and you know, you 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 must have a whale of a time going about that warehouse, you know, sampling all of these different aromas and flavors from the same spirit in different types of cask. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I regularly get samples delivered to the the house, and you can see a few boxes down there that oh, just yeah, came today. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, and and you know, everyone throws up some surprises. Mm. Uh, you could think you know a, a parcel of stock. You know, you could have a load of casks filled on the same day from the same distillery, uh, all the same type of barrel, um, and they turn out completely different, which is yeah, an absolute joy. And then also when we taste them on the panel, you can find that three people have a totally different perception of the flavor profile that it should go into so not only are all the whiskeys different so are we and uh yeah that's something to celebrate i think absolutely yeah, yeah. so so i was actually look, look, looking at this distillery before, sometime in the past and i remember someone saying that it's often said that the air around this distillery is alpine and that is a fancy word for freezing <laughs> <laughs> in the same way as some people say that Elgin, the area around Elgin, has a warmer climate than the rest of Scotland, it's sometimes said by people who've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> hey Tobias, I take your point about drowning the whiskey. It's like, yeah, you, if you've got if you've only got a glass, Tobias, then you have to be careful, of course, about adding the water. You know, if you add, if you add the water and you don't like. <laughs> Uh, the, the reduced version and you've got a bottle of it we'll drink the rest of it neat you know but some good some good tasting notes here smooth yeah. lemongrass and honey from michelle lemon yeah, peel and mint from glenn mm -hmm. yeah yeah and there's Anne saying yeah uh, Anne was reminding me by the way earlier that when i was talking about that oh, no. special code to buy the whiskey it's, it's in the email that andrew sent but Anne said, as a chemist, I like a water dropper. That's what I mean, Anne, yeah. It always seems a bit scientific to me, like in a laboratory. But I know you, you say you pour from the jug too, so well done. It's it's just clicked as well, um, which, which Anne is chemist, Anne, so hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> nah, I still prefer my um, cycle bottle. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, Anne's a, good, Anne's, Anne's a good friend of mine in the society, and we'll be seeing you soon, I hope, Anne. A live tasting sometime in the next several weeks, I hope. <laughs> okay, Jeez. folks. So oh. that's uh eucalyptus and pine. No one yeah. else had thrown that in, and that's again spot on whiskey Julian. I think I know who that is. Hmm. Okay, okay. Hmm. Now, folks, uh, we're going on to the next one, and for this one, we're actually leaving uh, the home of SMWS whiskey. So I'm interested to see what you make of this one. This is interesting because this distillery, uh, actually, I know the ambassador fairly well. And a few years back, I was introduced to the chap who owns the distillery and his finance director. And they were very keen, actually, to work with us. And I contacted, I uh, connected them with Ewan. And before we knew it, we had some 134s on the stock. And this one is 134.11. And because of uh, the climate of where it's matured, it can have very different results of very, very young maturation periods. And also, I am told by Shilton, the ambassador, that it depends when, whether the whiskey is matured on their underground warehouse or on their ground level warehouse, it can make a big, big difference. What do you think, Ewan? Yeah, I absolutely love everything that we've had from this distillery. Um, they're, they're so intense and there is something really exotic about them that you can't achieve in, in a colder climate of maturation. Um, so this is only four years old, 59.9%, uh, so still packs a fair punch. Um, but as you say, the it's a very different type of maturation, a much higher angel share there, you know, maybe up to about 10%, um, five times the amount you would, you would get here. So this is quite an old whiskey for maturing in that um in that climate and uh yeah it reminds me a little bit of um when you get in rum uh you, if you have a, a cask that's full term matured in a tropical climate it can be very different from a sort of early landed rum that's been matured in the uk really different character so everything that we've released from 134 um, has been full term maturation in Goa as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of flavor, really lovely exotic stuff um, hibiscus tea, honey, uh, a bit of a spice market there. There's tobacco, you know, there's these deep, 
Turkish delight kind of uh, aromas and flavors that just take you to another place, really. Mm. Delicious stuff. And I think I think it's very appropriate, actually, that we, we su- our suggested pairing with this one was curry or grilled pineapple. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I think yeah, actually, I think, uh, yeah. I was just going to say, I think a, a heavy coconut-based curry would be good with this. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, do, 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 do you know, Ewan, when we did our first ever curry and whiskey tasting? I do not. I tell you what, well, it was when, the, it was the year that uh, the next whiskey was distilled. There's a wee connection, so we'll get to that when we get to that. So um, I'm wondering if there's some some mind readers because there was a couple of points I, I was going to pick up on and, and mention, and then sure enough, Whiskey Julian and Ian McIntosh jump in there with with, um, with with you know with exactly the points I wanted to address. Look at the color of this, folks. You know this is unquestionably uh, the most uh, intensely colored whiskey on the table. It's the youngest whiskey on the table. Um, as you know, we, we you know we we don't use any uh, artificial color for our whiskies, so everything you see here is natural color. A- exactly the same kind of cask, reefal bourbon, same as the previous two whiskies. Younger, far less time to take on cask influence, but so much more color. And that really just um, that really, I guess, uh, that's really linked to what Ewan was talking about. How the maturation is 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 much more rapid um, in the climate. Um, uh, where, where the spirits distilled and matured, um, and so we, you know, you get much more. But you had mentioned you obviously lose more through evaporation. That's unfortunate, but you get a lot more cask influence um, in a shorter period of time. I was just casting my mind back, and I'm not. I, I, forgive me, I forget the member's name, but I had a great question about how um, how whiskey would mature differently in, say, somewhere like Goa. You know, in a hot climate, or or compared to Speyside, uh, and I seem to remember I wrote it up as a little piece for Unfiltered, um, and uh, I just thought maybe just you know worth just saying a few things here because, yeah, look, um, you know, the the the, the, the sort of uh, the most simple simple but thing is yes, we get we get more rapid extraction of flavor compounds from the cask, all of those flavor compounds that have been generated in the wood during heat treatment or are naturally present in the wood they're extracted much quicker because of the higher temperature. Um, but, they, they, you know, but, but, but what you don't necessarily get, although, you know, Anne will, would, I'm sure, correct me very quickly if I said, you know, this doesn't change the rate of chemical reactions necessarily. Um, but um, what, 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 what we don't see necessarily increase um, in, in rate, like, like the cask influence, is how the spirit changes over time. We talk about oxidative type reactions or transformative reactions in whiskey where chemical compounds change from one to another. So an acid to an ester, for example. So, you know, um, into a, yeah, an ester is a fruity like fruity compounds, alcohol to acids to esters. And, and that's not necessarily accelerated in the same way that the extraction of the flavor from the wood is. So I think it just poses a nice little discussion point. And if you're sitting down, you know, if you're sitting around with pals and you trying to, you know, having a few more drums later and, you know, being philosophical about it all. You know, this is an interesting one. The maturation is quicker, but it's not all all elements of maturation. You know, yes, it's the extraction of the wood, but it isn't necessarily, necessarily, celery, I've two, two minutes already. Um, it isn't necessarily the, the, what we call the reductive reaction, so the removal of sort of the heavier immature compounds from the wood, or indeed those transformation reactions um, those oxidative type reactions. So hopefully that doesn't, you know, that's not too much science and geekery, uh, but just some thoughts on maturation in these different climates, uh, which is really one of the really important elements as to why we've got such different character, spirit character between our first two whiskies and this one here, because on the face of it, you know, produced in a very similar way, matured in the same sort of cask, but in a much hotter climate. I think it also yeah. strikes at the point that you've been, you've been, saying for a while Andy is that you know every, everything about the flavor of a whiskey cannot be specifically and accurately explained by science you know the, 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 chemistry the, 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 yeah chemistry yeah the, there are things which are still unknown really you know things which are going on there chemically which uh, you can't actually explain in black and white and that's part of the the mystery and the myth about the whole thing 
Well, I, I just a uh, little anecdote. So there's a there's a there's a there's a gentleman called John Connor. Um, you and I know me at the Scottish Whiskey Research Institute. He spent like forty years of his life researching maturation and cast. I don't think there's probably anyone else on the data uh, it's always caveated cav caveated with it depends on the cask and he's absolutely right you know as Ewan said we can have two identical casks but we still have the same day. you know we have this incredible difference in flavor yeah absolutely just a, just a wonder, sorry, Ewan, could, yeah. sorry John um, I was just going to say I wonder just with the, the higher angel share like something that that I quite often find, if you've got a say a ten year old cask of scotch that comes in a sample of it and it's quite dark and it's really intense coconutty like this, um, and then mm. you go to bottle it and you find out that it's been leaking, um, not quite the same effect. But I wonder whether there's an element of you know making a sugar syrup like you're reducing the volume and you're intensifying all of the flavours that are in there with the the higher rate of evaporation. Pure speculation, but um, kind of makes sense to me. So, so, well, no, you're yeah. yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, Ewan. I mean, you know, you are concentrating flavour through 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 that evaporation, and that's going to be even more relevant in in a hot, you know really hot climate uh, where this is from. The, the other the other comment I was going to make, I don't know if you concur, chaps, and you know everyone else in the virtual room. Um, you kind of break you kind of breaking up a bit Andy are you, are you is Andy breaking up at your end you in yeah unfortunately yeah yeah you're breaking up a bit Andy okay we'll see we'll see if we can get you back we'll see if we can get you back okay just while just while we're waiting I'll just a couple of comments uh Nigel, Nigel and Jens in Frankfurt usually prefer cast strength. Don't bother with water. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Some people do. I, I, I always think that um, adding a little bit of water might just give you something which you're missing. But maybe you do do that. But you still prefer the cast strength. That's fine. Yeah. And Magnolia Pain and yeah. Uh, Turkish Delight Charles. Yeah. Kim's agreeing about the curry coconut curry yeah tobias good to see you again yeah i hope we catch up with you soon great stuff um i hopefully i'm back chaps oh there, there you are yeah. Yeah. Uh, every every cloud has a silver lining that um because i was dropping out there i had to d uh, um, just pop backstage so to speak and um andrew just gave me a wee reminder that uh you know with the 134 um Interestingly, as well as the spicy and sweet flavour profile that we've got here, we've also seen this in recent times from both peak and ripe fruit. That we, well, this Oliver is uh, the distilleries that we bottle from. Obviously, spirit in the case. You're, you're breaking up again. Yeah, yeah, pick it up, yeah. Andy. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Well, well, okay, folks. That was uh, that was one from outside Scotland, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, as you know, over the years, in order to give our members as wide a range of flavour as possible, because they've been reading and watching videos and on TV about whisky from other countries, so we've tried to give our members uh, flavour from different countries. Around the world, we we'll probably bought how many countries have we bottled from now? You know, I don't I know it's still mainly scotch that we do, but we have bottled from, yeah. Well, well, so England, Wales, Ireland, um, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, um, America, obviously, um, India. And yeah, that list continues to grow. To grow, we're, yeah. We're, we're speaking with more and more distillers, and you know, if if the spirit is is good quality, and if members in the local area also tell us that they're interested in it, then yeah, we'll we'll pick Absolutely. that up and run. We've just done one in Australia, haven't we, for the Australian branch? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think they've released that now. 
Yes, um, I guess. Yeah, I've, so seen, I've, seen, done, it, I've seen it on social. Yeah, we've, got, we've added in two new um, Australian distilleries recently. So, okay, uh, okay. I'm un unsure whether they've they've both been released, but I, I won't mention which ones they are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. I always um, yeah. I think it's a. I always make the joke that the first the first the first country that we did whiskey from outside Scotland was Japan. And that was 1992. And I tell people that it's a Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottling whiskey from Japan. There was rioting on the streets of Edinburgh. There was bonfires of membership cards outside the venues in protest. And, I'm only, and of course, I'm only kidding. There was three people who complained. <laughs> and, now, and now, of course, our members look forward to experiencing these flavours from other countries around the world and we've just done one so and everybody seems to have enjoyed that yeah yeah okay no new zealand yet ali cam although uh you and might know better than me oh i couldn't possibly say you possibly comment okay okay <laughs> good stuff uh, am, now, I, am i back I, Ross? I, I, Andy, are you back are oh you yeah back? also yeah in denmark someone was just saying there apologies how could i forget some great oh yes, from Sweden and Denmark. Well, yeah, yeah. I, do, I don't know how much of I don't know how much of your last ramblings I got, but I had to kind of go backstage, so to speak, with Andrew sure. because of the glitch. Um, but he just re, he just flagged to me just to mention um, Russ Strand is with us, who's um, appara apparently um, got the things he needs for every single pairing tonight, and suggested that the grilled uh, and and um, sorry, let me look at this. He's he's gone for all, all of the pairings tonight, and even the grilled pineapple, well grilled done, pineapple and angostines. So good on you for going to the trouble of um, sure, preparing some langoustines for uh, for the last whiskey. Uh, uh, that's a great way to spend a Thursday, isn't it? Yes, good absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and there's you. a I noticed that Kim Promnitz, our Australian Mel Gibson out there, he's asking mm. cheekily. Australia has whiskey distilleries. <laughs> yes, Kim. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Ever since you left, we started making whiskey. Okay. Okay, folks, we're moving on now. We're moving on to dram number four, which is 9.193. Okay. This is Angelic Fruit Mischievous Spice. Sweet, fruity and mellow, 17 years old. 56.8%. First fill bourbon barrel. Now this is a this is a distillery where we've created eight different flavor profiles in recent years. Again from the same spirit. So let's see what we think of this one. Ewan, what do you think? I mean the, on paper, this is my kind of thing, you know. Mm. Um this sort of high teen uh space cider in a very active cask and if you look at the the color it's actually quite close to the we're remarking on the the last one that's right um, that's right yes it, yes obviously it's taken it a lot longer to get there and um, however color extraction correct me if i'm wrong andy i think most of it happens in the first six months of yeah. filling into the cask anyway yeah so arguably this this was probably not not quite this because it'll have gone more intense as the the liquid evaporated um but a cracking quality bourbon cask mm -hmm. um lots of honey mango pineapple there's like a cinder toffee uh darkness to it that just gives complexity it's just so you know inviting and you want to jump straight into it really i've actually stayed at this distillery overnight and with Robin Lane, one of our panel chairmen, some years ago at the Speyside Whiskey Festival. And we were invited to do what we liked with the bar that was available. Free bar. Uh, have, for, have they met you before, John? <laughs> <laughs> for for, for, for these beautifully uh, appointed rooms that you were staying in. And a free bar, and honestly, it was the, <coughs> it was the most expensive whiskey and wine you could imagine. Just help yourself. That's, it. Wow. That's what I like. You, the, the, the best two, for a Scotsman, the best two words in the English language when used together are free and bar. 
Cheers. So you're right, Ewan. That is intensely rich. Um, am I still with you? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it's intensely <clears throat> rich, and there's a huge amount of, you know, sort of caramel toffee, vanilla, almost syrupiness. Um, I think you mentioned, did you say syrupy, Ewan? Um, and, and there's that kind of like condensed milk that the panel mentioned there. Michelle, the tannins are really tight as well. There's a huge amount of lovely tannin from the wood here as well. Um, agree with you uh, entirely there. The other thing that I picked out is um, that there's, there's, there's actually that lovely savory element as well. Um, I, I don't know if you get that, like um, not quite the intensity of the savoriness that you get with maybe something like a big meaty more back or but there's, there's definitely some of that savory character there as well. Um, and this just does to show that all this nonsense and the, these, you know, all this information I'm giving you to impress you, mate, you know, it doesn't always stack up. And, you know, if we look at, if we look at the distillery in question here, actually in theory on paper, it should produce a really light sort of fresh fruity style spirit. And broadly speaking, it does. Um, and the reason for that is that both, I think both the wash and the spirit stills have these sort of big what we call purifiers. So the the um, the spirit enter, exits the uh, the swan neck of the still before it hits the condenser. It enters a big sort of open copper chamber um, where the spirit will naturally cool, uh, and that means that there's, there's a little bit of recondensation uh, condensation occurs there. That you know the spirit recondenses and trickles and flows back to the pot of the still, which effectively essentially is 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 increasing reflux and therefore copper contact, and therefore re the removal of some of the compounds that give this kind of more heavy, meaty-like character to, to, some, to some of the spirits that we know. Um, Glendronic, you know, might be a good example of, of one of those. Um, but, uh, yeah, so look, a distillery that's set up, uh, you, know, to, 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 you know, to give lots of, lots of reflux, lots of copper contact, despite fruity style of spirit, but what we've got something, you know, still got some kind of nice, weighty, savoury character, um to it as well and uh, i mean just in my view just clearly filled into a, a fabulous cask um absolutely that ewan's um taking care of absolutely i think this one out of all of them and back to the fermentation again this is the shortest one of any that we've tasted at is 48 it? hours which is pretty much the shortest you can do yeah. um but then i think with their still set up they they're able to shape um that uh you know that that wash into just a, an absolutely lovely light spirit like you say mm. um but probably adds complexity by doing a maybe a heavier style mm. of fermentation and then mm. a lighter style of distillation mm. um i think um that's 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 that's, that's a really good observation you and uh, just just uh just just to be a uh, to, to, your your role it must be fantastic for you to actually see some casks that you've filled coming through to fruition and bottling. Yeah, um, it's it's absolutely brilliant. Um, obviously, with our additional maturation program, we see quite a lot of casks coming through. Sure. Lately, I remember remember transferring that to a different cask three years ago. Wow, that's that's worked. Um, but then I think the first casks that I ever arranged the filling of were back in 2014. So it, they're still not quite there yet. It will be another yeah. couple of years. But I'm looking forward to to bottling casks that I've kind of seen from the very start. Ah, fantastic! Um, yes, to the finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, all all of these comments are great, but I'm just picking out from Kim. You know, honey, dark fruits, rich, condensed milk, caramel, some tannins, and, and almost meaty. And you know, I guess that's what I was trying to describe, Kim. And you, you know, you've done it really well. You know, almost a meatiness to this dram, which um, adds, you know, adds real complexity. Yeah, Peter, you like this one? Double tick, double tick. Yeah, good stuff. I thought he's Peter's, Peter's a well-known London member. just what a great dram yeah absolutely yeah yeah i wish we could actually 
see you all to have a show of hands in terms of which ones that you preferred, but so we're, 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 going to, we're going to be getting back to those days very soon, I think. We're doing, in fact, there's live tastings going on at the moment in different parts of the country, and i just like to remind everybody whilst that's in my head, all of our venues are currently back open again. So if you've if you've missed the venues and haven't been able to get back there yet, well, now's the time. Glasgow, Bath Street, is over a thousand bottles. Because because remember that they opened and they had to close down a week later last year. So they've got all of these bottles. And if you're if you're looking for a bottle from uh, that you missed out on, that you didn't get, there's a chance that Glasgow might well have it. So if you're Give them a call, pay them a visit. You just never know. You never know. Don't don't I'm, just accept it. it's a because it's not available online anymore that there is no more of it. You just never know. John, um, sorry, I'm Andy. Up on it. I'm just picking up on a couple of things in the sidebar, and Andrew's flashed them up, and we promised we'd answer questions. Firstly, Michelle. Um, initially, I thought you know mild anchovy, and I thought. I don't know what you're getting at, but yeah, I I, I see what you mean. Um, very hard to explain that one, John. Your question is a is a super interesting one. Um, do, does does I thought there was one about the nose as well. Um, forgive me, everyone. I'm just trying to just track back these questions. Um, does does, does where you the whiskey on the tongue affect your note? Yeah, really good question. And, and okay, if you remember, you know, we, we were all taught at school, so to speak, that different parts of the tongue detected different flavors. So I think it's, um, and correct me, sweet at the front, kind of bitter flavors at the back, sort of um, acidity at the side of the tongue. Remember, we, we kind of taste five prior primary flavors, salty, bitter, sweet, um, uh, and so on. Um, but the, the, the reality is that famous tongue map, which I think was put together by a German scientist whose name eludes me at the moment. Please chip in if everyone, anyone knows. It's, kind of, it, it's not entirely correct. And what we know is that actually these different um, taste receptors are all over the tongue and present. all of them are present on all parts of the tongue. Uh, it's just the um, the uh, what's the word um, the density of of them varies and differs on different parts of the tongue. So look, hopefully that answers the question, um, possibly to some extent. Uh, but I would always recommend when we taste a whiskey, look, just you know, let it roll around the mouth, get it around the gums, around the teeth, all around the palate, because yeah, you're going to get a different experience. Those tannins are very very definitely often detected around the gums. Uh, I think I saw a. A comment again about tannins there so uh trust i've answered the question um i see some more questions i don't know if we can do them now um, um oh, i think there's a question about the, the acoustic guitar there uh, it's, a, it's actually a fender guitar the acoustic hang there not a martin you um, a question a question for you you and about does it ever has it ever gone wrong with a finishing cast? I'm just trying to find the exact question. Mm. It's just it's uh, just come up on the bottom there. Oh um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, ab absolutely, because we're dealing with a natural living product that's ever evolving, and you know, we if we buy in sherry wood, for example, we make a point of going down to the warehouse and nosing every single cask before we put any whiskey into it. Um, so we have very good quality control but sometimes inexplicably the odd one will go off on a tangent um but i would say nothing is beyond redemption you know there's a long period of time that every cask has to mature and try and reach a point where it's it's perfect for you know for itself um and either you can leave things for a, a, a very long time or you can go you know what that cask isn't doing its job let's move it to a different one uh, mm. And then three years later, you've got a fantastic whiskey. Um, one thing, uh, just a little bit, a nugget of information to add um, in the background. Everyone's picking up these slightly meaty, savoury notes from the number mm. nine. Um, and I remember when we bought this cask, 
there was or there was a, a number of these casks um and one piece of paperwork said lightly peated malt was used mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty much undetectable in all of them but there is this sort of je ne sais quoi like you know <laughs> that give that, that gives it this like layer of mm, that's really interesting so yeah um yeah, yeah, no, that, that, I, I didn't know that. You know, that's super interesting. And you often hear about um, space side distilleries using very small uh, quantities of lightly peated malt. My old, uh, my old um, home distillery being one of them. Uh, um, back to you and thoughts as well on that. It's going again, Andy. Oh. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're kind of coming in and out. Okay. Maybe try to pop pop your camera off, and then you can you can still give us yeah. the, the pearls of wisdom. Andy, uh -oh. Nadja and Jens from Frankfurt are suggesting it was David Hanig who did the, the tongue map. David Hanig. That sounds yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. can you hear loud and clear yeah, now, fair. yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'll leave the video off so there's two benefits. You might hear more of what I say. You don't have to look at me. <laughs> but, you um, beat me to it, Andy. You beat me to it. <laughs> good job you can't see what I'm doing right now, John. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just making a point about the panel and the society tasting panel. And of course, everybody, all of the all of our members listening tonight will know that those are the people who are responsible for uh, those uh, rather colourful tasting notes and the kind of often wacky, crazy names that we assign to these whiskies, but also it is, you know, it's a very important quality control step in what we do. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's the panel, you know, to sort of pick up on Ewan's point about, um, you know, well, it's the, that's the panel who decide when to bottle out whiskies. You know, why we're not constrained by, it needs to be a 10 year old or a 15 year old and, and all of that. We bottle the whiskey when the panel says it's ready to bottle. Um, so yeah, just 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 wanted to flag that one, and hopefully I'm still audible. Sure, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Lots, so, and so, lots, of, lots and lots of good comments from the the members here. Hey, Anne Anne Bingham remembers David Hannig as well. Obviously, it's discredited now. She's saying. Uh, yeah, Andy, I think uh, Greg Mill knew and is saying, what type of spirit cask finishing is your favourite and which ones are more tricky to manage? Um, <clears throat> probably my personal favourite is um, American Oak Sherry, so either Pedro Jimenez or Oloroso, those oxidatively aged cherries. Um, I think the balance you get with the kind of heft of the wine and the the lovely rounded vanilla that the American oak can give with, with its toasty flavors is like kind of perfect for me. And it tends to go well with lots of different spirit styles. So you could go quite light, uh, you could go a meaty style, you could go peated. And these ones really add, you know, add to the party with all of those spirit styles. Um, so yeah, hopefully that um, that answers yeah, okay. the question. Okay, okay, okay. Well, tricky, tricky to manage. I would say wine casks. So mm. like red wine casks, it could be like Bordeaux or Rioja or something like that. If they're not handled properly, uh, they you know you need to fill them pretty much at the winery to to, um, to get uh, the freshest. There are some companies that are that are excellent at um, at handling the casks, but you kind of have to be careful with with wine casks. And, sure. and, okay, thank you. And, and exactly why the cast that we're buying from a ref, it's all about, you know, close partners who we understand and know what, how they do things, you and um, I think. Yeah, Can absolutely. I just quickly um, sort of re respond to Anne about the Mami meaty taste? And I don't know, but as you're a chemist, I'll, uh, um, I'll sort of be quite specific. When, when we tend to talk, when we in whiskey tend to talk about meaty, uh, we're usually referring to character that's derived, um, you know, as a result of sulfur compounds present in the spirit. So I'm not sure that's necessarily what we might describe as umami. Um, you know, it's very differently the kind of sulfur derived compounds that that, that that give that kind of meaty or weightiness to the spirit. So hopefully that's useful and uh, a bit of chemistry to, um, to throw in for you. 
Thanks, Andy. And just uh, just to link back to what I said before, this whiskey was distilled in 2003, and that was the year that we did our first ever curry and whiskey tasting. Mm. So there's <laughs> there's a completely irrelevant fact for you, you know. But 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 what, 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 the reason I mention it is that these days we do so many whiskey and other pairing tastings now. You know, it's been quite incredible how in our journey, in our members' journey, we've discovered that uh, whiskey can be enjoyed with other things as well. Whereas generations ago, it was always regarded as maybe with a beer, but with nothing else. So it's fantastic. And we've got a couple of very, very special tastings, pairing tastings coming up as well. Uh, soon, which you'll see on the website, something you might never have thought of. Okay, so the last dram of the evening, folks, is number 4254. This is the only one tonight that's been from the islands, okay? It's Oil and Coastal. John Cameron mentioned uh, Oil and Coastal earlier. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, John. Uh, it's 15 years old, 61.6 from a refill bourbon barrel, Okay. And we suggested this one, if everyone's got their tasting pairings organized, we suggested with this one, grilled langoustines or cold prawn party ring. Okay. So here we go. Just a comment on the strength there. I mean, that's, that's still quite remarkably high for something at 15 years. And I think okay. that this distillery quite as, as common practice fills at, High strength, if not still strength, still still strength. strength. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so you get a very different type of maturation, and they tend sure. to go for for much longer, um, yeah. because they start higher as well. Yeah, I read. Um, yeah, I read exactly that earlier. You and when I was on my fact check in sixty eight percent fill strength. Yeah, I remember a few years ago, you and well, a lot of years ago, when we uh, we bottled a whiskey at sixty six percent. And when I read it, I nearly fell off my chair. But then, of course, it dawned on me that, you know, I wouldn't have gone into the cask at 63.5, you know. Not Scotland, yeah. anyway. For everyone, um, you know, um, the, the kind of rule of thumb is that you lose about half a percent ABV strength every year along with your, you know, rule of thumb, 2% angel share. So 2% yeah, yeah. of bulk, bulk volume and half a percent ABV for every year of maturation. That's kind of what we talk about. We were talking about flavour profiles earlier, chaps, and we know there are some flavour profiles which members really, really like, and we know this is one of them, oily and coastal. Members really tend to uh, enjoy our oily and oily, and some people are not into it. That's the same with any flavour profile, but the ones who like it really enjoy it. But to, to go back to, I think it was, is it John Cameron, and the, the, the question yeah. at the start or the point, yeah, you're right. We, we, we don't see as much of, as, of this as lots of the other flavour profiles, even, you know, peated. Um, I, I guess the reality is because far fewer distilleries produce this style of spirit, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, we've got some there's some old friends that when we do panel tasting sessions, you kind of know their potential candidates for oily and coastal. But, you know, as you and I'll tell you, you pro probably concur, you know, often there'll be debate between us about, you know, do we really do? Do we need to put this in peated because there's obviously a peated element to it, or can it sit in oily and coastal? Um, you know, we just have to. We kind of have to think carefully because obviously, you know, um, we need to be very clear and explicit that it's peated whiskey if it is. So, and in fact, goes well some way to explaining the kind of thinking and how we work and approach this this flavour profile. And so, a combination of the two really is there's you know a little bit of overlap into the peaty domain, and um, the, you know there's, there's only a few distilleries that you know classically produce this this style um and uh you know some of that oiliness perhaps can come from a you know waxy character and we know that's a character that's pretty rare in scotch whiskey um so, anyway just i don't know if you and you you know you had any comments on that yeah it, i would agree with you so it's always a bit of a dilemma but then you i think i, ha I always have to remind myself that the flavor profiles are just a broad kind of guide yeah. And the, if you know you, de you d delve deeper and you read the tasting note or the bottle note, it will be incredibly clear that there's peat influence in there. Mm. So it's not like you'll 
you'll fall into a trap and buy something that you weren't looking for. Um, you know, the same as you might put um, a heavily peated 30 year old whiskey into like the old and dignified flavor profile because mm. it has all these lovely Rancio Dunnage Warehouse uh, leathery kind of notes mm. from long maturation. Yeah, of course, it's got lots of peat, but why would you just put it in the peated category if, when it fits in the other one? So it's always a balancing act. And yeah, uh, you it's know, not an exact science, before, is it? It's not yeah, an exact science. We touched on it before that, yeah. that the three of us could think it was a different profile. Sure, and you, sure. you just have to settle yeah. on one. And yeah, sure. um, oily and coastal only makes up about 5% of, um, no. of the flavor profiles because, yeah, as Andy no. said, it's a handful of distilleries that fit into that kind of style, really. Yeah. The, see, the uh, nice thing is that the the majority of them are usually awesome that we see through the through the panel that end up in oily and coastal. A good, a good comment there, chaps, from Leslie. She says four whiskies, and I still have the speed to swat a fly. Getting in practice for a holiday in Leith. <laughs> well done, Leslie. That's a new Olympic sport you've just devised there. Leslie, I'd only had two, and I couldn't say necessarily error or anything. <laughs> yeah, somebody said earlier, Andy, they didn't get any celery in the tasting room. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, see you soon. We'll see you soon Thanks. in London. Good to see you. So it's, uh, what do we think? I just yeah, think lovely. this is wonderful, you know. Lovely from Kim, you know, that evocative sense of place again. Sanji's back from the beach. Salt, and um, very specifically, not adjacent. Salt on the breeze, not in yeah. the sand. Lovely, yeah. Yeah. That ozone yeah. character that's pretty rare in whiskey, but I tell there. you what. I tell you what. A couple of days ago, I was doing a little tour of uh, Northwest Scotland, but I started off in Oban, and I was in Eosk, a fish restaurant on a pier, and I had a plate of oysters, and that just brings it back to me. This brings it back to me. Those, those, all those oysters a few days ago. Um, yeah, so so um, distillery that produces both a peated and an unpeated style, and obviously this is the the peated style of of spirit from from this particular island distillery. But, well, yeah, yeah. that's what did you say peated? Yes, because because what I was going to say this is quite interesting. This yeah. isn't the peated variant. Um, yeah, it's not. And and really? so there were a couple of a couple of things that I thought. Um, so they produce, I, I thought this was quite unusual, they, they produce more of the peated style than the unpeated, mm. which when you have a distillery that do both, they normally do a small amount of peated mm. and the rest unpeated. Um, but then I'm, I'm not, I don't think that they would, you know, have a contamination and distillation. I think they'll be, they, would, they wouldn't mm. have that kind of problem. But this is a refill barrel. So mm. I wonder whether the barrel once had some of the peated variant in it. Because there's obviously there is um, those peated notes in there. Yeah, um, but it is it is the unpeated spirit. Is it interesting? Yeah. Um, and, and look, um, actually, is it just on on your um, you know sort of matured in a cast that previously held peated whiskey. This is anecdotal. Uh, something that I observed look, having looked at lots and lots of samples. Signature for me, where you've got the peat element from the previous use of the cask. It's almost that kind of, you know, when we sometimes describe it as um, ashtray-like, you know, that kind of really mm -hmm. ashy peatiness and, and, yeah. or, or kind of, you know, bonfire embers. That's almost a little yeah. signature for me. I don't know if anyone out there kind of picks that up sometimes in these whiskies. And, you know, there are overtly peated cask finishes out there on the market. And, uh, yeah, just a, just a thought um, for, for everyone. Bob Wenting. Great to see you, Bob. All the Hello. best. See you soon. Also, comments from Anne and Whiskey Julian about tastings in Winchester. For those of you in that area, we're hoping to have a tasting in Winchester very soon. Yeah. Anne, something briny about it. Yeah, you're right. And that's what we often describe. It's almost like salty, yes. salty, yes. briny yes. tang from the whiskies. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, there's certain certain brands that love to tell you about their um, sea washed walls of their warehouses and and all that kind of stuff. And you know, as a chemist, you'll be pleased. Well, you know, maybe interested to hear that, to my knowledge, no one's ever picked out sodium chloride in a sample using um, GCMS or or anything like. So, where does that brininess come from? That's a good question. It's probably perception rather than a 
that is uh, hey, hey, on fly Andy, the compound. You, Andy, you've touched on something there. That's one of the biggest debates that I've I hear about this saltiness and whiskey. Yeah. And uh, the lack of the sodium chloride in the drink can be still people talk about the saltiness, you know. Fantastic. Yeah, doesn't doesn't distill over, I'm afraid. Yeah, 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 yeah. More and some somebody said uh, that they wish they had an SMWS venue in Aberdeen. Well, we don't yet, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe, Maybe in the we'll future. open one for a week and then have to shut again. <laughs> <laughs> So, folks, what do we think? Any, any final comments? We, uh, we'd love to have you in front of us, as I say, to find out what was your favourite. But I think a lot of people are seem to be saying that the last two have been their favourites. Tell you what, if you go back to the first one now, it mm. smells like uh, watermelon boiled sweets to me. It's absolutely fruity. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's an interesting yeah. thing you mentioned there, Ewan, is that Sometimes going back uh, after you've had a whiskey, you can the taste can change, and also you can taste a whiskey at different times of the day and get a different impression as well, or on different days. It's just quite fantastic. Going back you know, to the lemons and uh, lemons on the lawn, some of that sort of linseedy window putty character developing there, and and actually celery. Not even joking. <laughs> <laughs> I do I'll get, I do get some like um, some celery tops, like it's with, with green grass. Yeah. Like, uh... Michelle saying five, five, four, one, two, three. Okay, okay. So Michelle preferred the scotches. So uh, number one forty-two, number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, there's uh, there's a bit of a. Slight similar with SMWS in Cheltenham. Don't think we've done one there yet, have we? Okay. Well, thanks for all your contributions, folks. That's been absolutely wonderful. Any, any closing comments, Andy? Um, yeah, um, I've enjoyed myself. So thank you, everybody. And thanks for your contributions and asking lots of questions and giving me a chance to um, bore you to death with a little bit of chemistry and science. Um, but no, I mean, you know, genuinely sort of closing remarks for me is, you know, in many ways, what was in the glass from a scientific perspective here tonight was, was you know, a lot of similarities, you know, relatively light, delicate spirits, um, refill bourbon casks with the exception of, I think, one, um, but remarkable differences. You know, you can see spanning five different flavor profiles. We could probably argue they could fit into more. Um, so just real flavour diversity, which is, you know, exactly what Ewan strives through the spirit he buys uh, and the cast that he uses for his maturation programme to achieve, to give that variety um, to members. So that, I suppose those are my closing remarks. I just, I hope everyone's thoroughly enjoyed it like I have. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Ewan. Ewan. Yeah, um, what Andy said, um, but but also, yeah, I think this has been a bit of an ode to the humble bourbon cask, mm. um, which is just a, you know, a stunning cask type that I think is a, a little bit underappreciated. Um, and we've, we've seen what it can do and it's different, uh, you know, levels of uh, activity. So the number of uses, the different sizes, so the hogshead of the second one being slightly larger and kind of coast the maturation on. Um, yeah, I just think it's a we've we've demonstrated very well um, how how good the the humble bourbon cask is. Fantastic, and uh, I think am I right? You in saying that we're still in Scotland looking at the well, twenty million casks maturing, but ninety percent of them are bourbon, ex bourbon yeah. casks. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if not more, yeah. Absolutely. So, but but we we but as everyone, all our members know, we're now doing more finishing than we. Although we've been doing finishing for a long, long time, it's not been a recent thing. But we're doing more of it now, so there's lots more flavors to come. I've said through some of these whiskies tonight how many flavor profiles we've created from the same spirit through Ewan's uh, cask management. So, lots more flavors to come, folks. In the immediate future, we have the the August tasting coming up in four weeks time and we have Mark McVartson with us on that, he from Highland Park Great uh, and uh, he's a great guy yep, 
smashing broke. And we no, may also lost. we may also have a very interesting guest from a well known food uh, company. But we'll wait and see about that. As far as today's, the previews were out today for the outturn next week, and the full outturn is out next week on the 6th of August, of course. And as I said before, all venues are now open, and we hope to see you there. I have had the pleasure of seeing some of my uh, members from the... I, I, I'm based in the south of England, and some of my friends from down there have been on the, the, the tasting tonight, and I hope to see you live soon. And I also hope to visit Glasgow and Edinburgh again very soon too. I was in Glasgow last week, actually. So just raise a glass to say thank you very much, all you members. Uh, thanks for all your comments. That's been incredible. I think we've I think we've managed to achieve what we thought we were trying to achieve, and that's a good interaction uh, with ourselves and our members. Any comments that you have uh, now or in the future? Let us know. Let us know through member services. We'll be happy to talk to you about anything you've got. It's your society, after all. All the best. Lanjiva. In good spirit, all. Lanjiva. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>